happy Monday or non-happy Monday, whichever works for you today. Couple things. One, you have objectives due this evening, which is true every week. Um, if you looked at them in advance, and by I mean before Friday of last week, maybe on Thursday. I don't remember when I did that. It may have said you have nine objectives, and now you go in and it's telling you have four or five. So I moved some objectives because I realized we did not get as far as I thought we would when I set them up. You're still gonna, I don't want to say have to do them. You'll get to those, but like later. So this week, those objectives that I moved, you'll see. So if you finish tonight's objective, and you look at next week, it says that there's like 14 objectives. So that's a lot. Instead of trying to like move them back and forth, I just dumped everything forward. And after lecture on Wednesday, I will go and move out what needs to be moved out. That will happen, I don't want to say for the rest of the semester, but probably. You should expect them to move. What won't happen is they can't go backwards. So I can move them forward in time, but I can't be like, oh, you should have learned this three weeks ago. The platform will basically have a meltdown on me. So you have that calculator. Please remember to bring your calculator. If you could, in this moment, bust out a calculator and your periodic table and something to write with, we will work maybe not many examples, but examples today. So some of you, maybe not some of you, likely all of you took mini exams one last week. Some of you were like, oh, that was, that was a cakewalk. Some of you are like, I don't know what I did wrong, but that didn't work. because you've already used all your like 12 pennies that they give you for financial aid. I'm well aware that what we give you is not enough. If you cannot afford it via financial aid, you need to send me an email. I don't really know what we're going to do, but I will ask someone to help us have enough calculator. Please make sure you bring it with you. We will need it for every assessment. I already said that. Okay. If you were like, okay, how on earth should I have studied for mini exam one? Options, office hours, I hold five a week. You can come, you can ask questions. If you would prefer not to talk to me, for whatever reason, you would rather talk to your peers. SI means three days a week. She should have sent you an email with like what is gonna be covered in all the sessions this week, right? You can pick any one, you can go to any, you can go to none, you can go to some. It is more example problems. The best way to be super successful in my exams is to work so many examples. The more you work, the less you have to think about it. I tend to say somewhere on the order of 15 to 30 per topic, which is why we use Alex, because you're gonna get a ton of practice in there. You'll get a ton of practice in SI. If the idea of coming to my office and going to peer tutoring or going to SI where you work with peers doesn't appeal to you. UNF also offers free tutoring. This is quite small to read and I'd like to apologize but I couldn't figure out how to make it any bigger. Basically, these are the different tutoring options. The first one is in, the, in building two, Monday through Thursday afternoons, pretty much before class. The library on the second floor is Monday, Tuesday, Thursday evenings. You guys are not predominantly living in the dorms. If you don't live in the dorms, it is a little creepy to go to tutoring in the dorms. I don't really know how you'd get in. I don't really advocate for it. But if you live in the fountains, there is a tutor that lives in, not lives, 
They show up there. You can walk downstairs in your slippers and get help. I mean, you can wear your slippers anywhere. Um, they have Zoom office hours in the evenings. They have one-on-one -on -one appointments. <clears throat> this indicates that they only have them for two hours a week, which doesn't quite seem right. It feels like they should have more of them, but I don't really know. This is what I pulled from their website. During these blocks and in these locations, the tutors basically sit there and go, I guess I'll watch Netflix. I guess. So one of those tutors who took my class several years ago sat by my office and was like, so like, no one comes. And I was like, what do you mean no one shows up? She was like, I've watched two full seasons of some show and I don't remember. She's done all of her homework. She basically gets paid to sit there. It's a really sweet gig, in my personal opinion. If you need help, before you start paying like a stranger you don't know. Now, if you are paying your friend who took this course, that's different. If you are in some very odd bartering situation with baked goods, that's on you. However it is that you get help, these are the free options. I write the mini exam, I write the lectures, I read the textbook, I did not write that textbook. These are all the ways that we can get help. The next mini exam will not be formatted the same as the first one, but it'll be quite similar. Some number of problems. As you may or may not see, your mini exams are not yet graded. There are somewhere between 50 to 63 people that come in this class, kind of fluctuates. But I teach this class at three and there are 100 people in there. So I had a stack of about this many mini exams. I'm down to like this many. They will all be done. You will get them on Wednesday. Provided nothing terrible happens to me. Terrible means I get COVID and I'm very ill. I break my fingers. I don't know. I will return your stuff in a timely manner. Because they are all hand graded, it takes longer than like a multi-guest bubbly form. You will get them back. I will post a key on Wednesday. We'll get them back at the end of class because if I hand them out at the beginning, you will, uh, <laughs> Ignore everything I say for the next 75 minutes. Because that's what I do. If you give me something, I will read it and not listen to you. 100% of the time. Any questions about any of this information and or other detailed info? Yeah? Um, one question. You mentioned at the beginning of the semester we were going over the syllabus. There was an online resource that replaced the book even though it wasn't by the department. I'm not sure where I can go to access that. Hmm, that's a great question. The question is, where did I hide the link to the e-text? That's a great question. Do you know where it is? I'm pretty sure if you go on to Alex, it's under what I forget which tab it is, but it's under what it shows Alex and all that. If you go all the way down to the bottom, there's like a free access textbook. It is on there. It might be on the home page. But you have to like scroll to where it says what you need. It might there might be a hyperlink to one that's called eText. Or you can send me an email and I will send you the link. I will also figure out where it is hiding. But any Gen Chem textbook that you can find will work. Supposedly they have them in the library and you can check them out. But I use the word supposedly, supposedly, very strongly. Because what they say they have and what I can find when I go in there are not always the same thing but you can get them there. I'm recording this, so like, you can just download it. But I'm not gonna talk about that on the internet. Um, there are lots of ways that you can get a free access of a textbook. Feel free to ask around. Other questions? I don't want to say as promised, but we're going to start with a few minutes of naming review. So there is, today we're going to talk about diatomics and some naming practice exercises. On Wednesday, we will talk about how to use the Greek prefixes for things like dihydrogen monoxide, which most people just say is water. When we think about carbon dioxide, when is it, when do we use the di, tri, tetra prefixes? We'll talk about that on Wednesday. Trying to break this into smaller, more manageable bits. If we do all the naming at once, you all kind of like get real glassy eyed and there's nothing else happening. 
I also find it kind of irritating in law. So diatonics. These are elements that come as pairs. So typically, when you go to the element store, aka you go into nature and you find any of these, they come as a single element. Things like sodium. It's just like sodium single atoms. There are these things called diatomics. The ones that we are most familiar with are things like O2 gas. It turns out that there are seven of them that you need to learn slash memorize. You can kind of pick whichever one of these you want. So it's H2, N2, O2, F2, CL2, Br2, and I2. If you look at your friendly periodic table, these seven, with the exception of hydrogen, make a seven. We start here at nitrogen, whoops, go over to fluorine and down to iodine. Those will come as diatomics. When we see a reaction with something like fluorine gas or chlorine gas or oxygen gas, it comes as a pair. They are more stable that way. We do not tend to encounter oxygen in, in the world as anything other than O2, except for O3, which is ozone, which is bad. So there are other states, but they are unstable, unstable, unstable and not quite as common. Questions about diatomics? Yeah? Why does not bromine have two? Oh, because I forgot. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought it was like a special line. Nope, that was just <laughs> talking too fast, trying to write at the same time. Other questions? So, as we've started to hopefully memorize our. Oh, God, sorry. Would this also include. Sorry, I'm thinking of the word. Like the ions, we have mercury too, and it has the. So H, as HG2, 2 plus, is that the one? Yes, that's the one. So it turns out mercury 1, so it's called mercury 1, but really everything about this says that there's two of them. So it turns out that this is that you have HG plus HG plus. So both any mercury ion in this complex has a single charge. It turns out that this doesn't exist alone. So it only exists when they are connected with singular charges. So what we don't see is HG2 plus or HG single atom plus. It has to come with its best friend of the same thing. So this is similar to a diatomic. It's more of a special case diatomic. But it arises from the two mercury plus ions being stuck together. And that, beca that is because they are more stable electronically. So we haven't really talked about where, how we get to ions. We just said like, oh, you remove an electron. When you remove an electron from mercury, it turns out that the inside of the mercury atom is way stabler, way more stable. When there are two of them together, then either of these are alone. So it turns out for mercury, we only see it as mercury, mercury one, where there's two. I know it seems weird, and I, there are no great examples, but that's just why. So then you wouldn't call it a diatomic, you would just say this in particular is a diatomic ion. Yes. I wouldn't drop it into the, if I thought about like a diatomic bucket. Diatomics tend to be and its elements, not like carbon monoxide, like CO, wouldn't necessarily be a diatomic. This is just when do we see them, the elements that come special. Otherwise, when we start to write balanced equations, what we'll see is like, if you were to have iron metal, it just shows up as Fe. It doesn't need to come as a diatomic or a triatomic or anything else. It just shows up as like, Fe solid. 
Let me go from there. Good question. Other questions? So we have some naming examples. So I have five names to formula and five formula to names. I will write them, start working on them as soon as I finish. So we have vanadium, three phosphate, strontium, oxide, aluminum, hydroxide. Sodium, sodium, sulfate, and iron to chrome. give you guys another 20-30 seconds to try to come up with answers for as many of these as possible. So the Roman numerals tell you what the charge is. Yeah. Um, is that A always? Yes. Is there, if you write potassium somewhere, A is the symbol of potassium, right? Is These are two separate types oh, of questions. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize. No, I, I mean, that's a, it's a good question. They do look quite similar, and I don't think I meant to do it that way, so I can see where you were like, these, these words do not. Does not confuse. So up here for the vanadium 3 phosphate, this Roman numeral tells us that the vanadium ion has a 3 plus charge. So we have vanadium 3 plus and a PO4 3 minus, which means that we do not need any subscript. So it's just vanadium phosphate. For strontium oxide, what is the chemical formula for that? We have an SRO, which is exceptionally correct. So for strontium, based on the periodic table, we know that it is a two plus. Oxygen, based on the periodic table, is a two minus. Therefore, they are one to one. Aluminum hydroxide. What is the charge on aluminum? What about hydroxide? OH minus. So you should have aluminum, open parentheses, OH, close parentheses, 3. One of the things that students often want to do is to distribute this 3 over this, to where you have aluminum, oxygen subscript 3, hydrogen subscript 3. It turns out that that means something different. <clears throat> if it comes in a parentheses or it is a polyatomic ion, we need to make sure that they stay together. Questions. What questions do we have thus far? Sodium sulfate. How many sodium atoms are in sulfate? I got a two in the back. Na2SO4. And for iron two chromate, iron two means it's Fe2 plus. Chromate is CrO4 two minus, which gives us Fe. What questions do we have about? No. It's okay. 
Sorry, I just saw it do that. That was funny. What questions do we have based on these? So whenever you have like a uh, on the higher topic, I'd say we have the two positive directions, you know, are those the two minus? Does it cancel out when you have anything there at all? Correct. So the question is about the charges. If you're showing work, if you're like trying to work this out. So I would look at Fe 2 plus and CrO4 2 minus. You want these to always be a neutral atom. When you write them over here, you don't need to include the charges. You can have it as like your side notes, but the final answer doesn't contain any charges whatsoever. The goal is that the cations and the anions cancel out, and we can use the subscripts in order to balance those if necessary. Good question. Yeah? Um, how do you get the subscript of 4 in NaCO4? Like it's okay. The sulfate ion is SO4 2 minus. So this is the <coughs> SO4 2 minus ion. So the 4 comes with the O. That one's not necessarily the same as this three here. How did you get that three there on the aluminum hydroxide? So we know, it's not a periodic table. If you are not in the transition metals, we know that the first column is plus one, the second column is plus two. We hop over that and we look at boron, that whole column is plus three. And so the aluminum is a plus three. The hydroxide ion is OH minus. So to make these two balance, if we have aluminum three plus and OH minus, how many minuses do we need in order to balance out the three plus? We need three of those. So the subscripts help us balance these out. And that's true for any of these examples, whether you go from name to formula, Less so in the formula to name star already balanced for you. But if you were to fill out a table where it gave you the two ions, you would have to take into account that information. Good question. Any other questions? What is the first answer here? Does cobalt need to have parentheses in the middle? I hear a couple of threes. Here, as you were correct in the back, this is potassium hydroxide. What about SNCl4? <clears throat> so I'm hearing, or I heard, a 10 4 chloride. Is tin a transition metal? No. So only the ones in the center part of your periodic table need to have parentheses in them. If it is in any of the, the first two or these two, they only can have one state. They, tin can only be plus four. So in this case, it would just be tin chloride. Good question, or good mental question. What about RH and O3, 2? This is rhodium. What is the charge on rhodium? 2. So we have open parentheses, Roman numeral 2, nitrate. What is this last one? Okay, we have tungsten. What is the charge on tungsten? And this is the carbonate ion. What questions do we have about these examples? Yeah. So for the transition metals, what is in the hydrogen? Like the name. 
So on the periodic table, so the question is, which ones do we, well, I guess it's which ones do we need to memorize? You're responsible for the names of elements 1 through 86, not including 57 to 71, which is what's at the bottom. You're also responsible only for the polyatomic ions on the back. Alex and I have a slight disagreement, not shocking, about when you need to use a parentheses. It is true that for metals that only have one oxidation state, they do not, regardless of location, need to contain a parentheses. So it turns out that zinc can only be two plus. So it's just how it rolls. I found that you guys, students, have a very difficult time remembering which ones only have one state and which ones don't. So instead, for anything that I grade, everything in a transition metal must have the parentheses, period. However, Alex is going to straight up tell you that you're wrong. Shocking. In those cases, I would make a note of which ones only have certain states for the purposes of Alex for the purposes of anything that I give you, I will use this nomenclature unless it's in column one, two. It turns out that these are numbered in a weird order. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Then we count the transition metals. We'll get to why that is later. But anything in what's the taller blocks, you do not need a Roman numeral for. Anything in the center block, you definitely need a Roman numeral for. Yeah. The question is, do we need to memorize the masses? Absolutely not. You may hopefully by the end of the semester know that like oxygen is 16, but you please never memorize that. What you all get on the exam would literally be this, not exactly this, but with white out, where it took out the name. It's going to look like this. It's going to have all the same good stuff in there. Yes. Where's that on here? So 10 can also have more states than that. I know that wasn't my device. Um, so for the rules following the periodic table, 10 has a plus four. <clears throat> I think this is saying that 10, 2, which would be its abnormal state, because you can't have 10, 4, which would be the normal state. It would go by the Stannis, which we are not memorizing those, just so we're all clear. Don't have to memorize the whatever fancy words. So for 10, it should be, so in this case, it would be easy to know that you don't need to know the charge. For the opposite direction, you can always use the counter ion to determine that in this case. You should assume that it is 10 plus 4 unless otherwise indicated. Good question. Other question? Uh, why is it cobalt 3 phosphate and not phosphine? PO4, the phosphate ion is PO4. The phosphite ion is PO3. They do, however, both have a 3 minus charge. Other questions? So the Roman numerals tell you the charge. So what is the charge on a phosphate ion? Three. It's okay. So the phosphate ion is a three minus ion. In order to make it neutral, what is the charge on the phosphate or on the cobalt have to be? Three. It turns out that cobalt, 
flex to be a lot of different things. You can have cobalt one, you can have cobalt three, you could have cobalt five, not really, but you, it can be many different things. So the way we annotate that this way, so good examples of this when we really see this in our real lives, because I think that's kind of the disconnect. Different fireworks are different colors. It turns out that those come from different metal ions. So rust, because we live in Florida and we encounter it everywhere, is a change in the transition state of iron. So well, I'm going to get this wrong, aren't I? I think it goes from iron 2 to iron 0 or iron something to something else. We'll just leave it a vague term. This helps us figure out which one it is. If you are not a chemist, where you would use this is sometimes when we make building materials, solar materials, other types of devices or products, they will use certain counter ions in them, and we want to make sure you have the right one. So that's what it's trying to get for you. Other questions? So let's return back to balancing chemical equations. So in my first lecture today, the whole projector died, which is super terrifying. Which means, so I taught without slides. This was unfun for 100% of participants myself included, if that happens, hopefully you will all have a device. The slides are freely posted. In that case, we'll just kind of, I don't want to say like struggle along. That's what we did. So just as a heads up, if that ever happens, it will be terrible. We will all survive. But mostly, it will be terrible. So this will be much more exciting because I don't have to rewrite what's on the board. So. On Wednesday, right before our mini exam, we started talking about reactions. In Gen Chem, we are going to meet five reactions. In chapter three, we are going to meet three of those five. So we started with, and I feel like I basically just like shouted that there were things at you, and then we took a test. So you may or may not remember. Do we have combination reactions? Where A plus B goes to C, a good example of that would be two magnesium solid plus O2 gas gives you two MgO solid. So in a combination, it is one entity plus another entity gives you a product. Alex is going to ask you to like identify the type of reaction. If there's only one product, it has to be combination. There's no other way for this to be something else. The second type is a decom de decomposition. So a decomposition is basically the opposite of a combination. One product or one reactant plus heat melt into its parts. So D with heat decomposes into E plus F. So an example of that would be calcium carbonate solid decomposes into calcium oxide plus CO2 gas. Now, in my course, I'm not going to give you Magnesium reacts with oxygen. Tell me what we make. I think that gets a little complicated. Less so on like a combination reaction because that's like basically what we did with all the numbers before this. But decomposition feels kind of hard. It should. Well, I'm not going to ask you to predict the products. In chapter four, in a new type of reaction that we meet there, I will ask you to predict the products. Those products follow like patterns and they make a lot of sense. With both of these, what you need to be able to do is 
Like on the next example, if I give you the words, you need to be able to come up with the equation. You should be able to identify, is this reaction a combination, decomposition, or in a second we'll talk about combustion. So we're not going to be able to, well, the ability to predict these products is complicated and frankly outside the scope of this course for these reactions. In chapter four, we will learn that for something called a metathesis reaction, but this is still chapter three, so we are not there yet, just so we're clear. So, perhaps more people's exciting, or a more exciting reaction, is a combustion reaction, because who doesn't like stuff blowing up? Maybe that's just me. Combustion. It is when A, hydrocarbon, in either the gas or liquid phase, in this case gas, reacts with oxygen gas to create two things, H2O plus CO2. And these are both gases, although in some cases it makes liquid water. So in a combustion engine such as your car, sometimes the water comes out as a gas and sometimes it comes out as a liquid. It actually has to do with how well your engine functions, plus the humidity of the environment, as well as basically the temperature outside. But overall, a combustion reaction is relatively simple. Something plus oxygen gives you water and carbon dioxide, period. Now, for the purposes of this course, we are gonna stick to hydrocarbons, which are things with carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. There are other things that you could burn, things that might contain nitrogen or sulfur or anything else. Those other elements are accounted for in other products here. Again, I'm not gonna ask you to predict those. If I ask you to predict a combustion reaction, it's because there's only two products and that's all there is. So an example would be the combustion of propane, which is C3H8 gas plus 5O2, also a gas, and that gives you three CO2 plus four H2O gas. What questions do we have about the three types of reactions that we're discussing? So now, let's look at some examples. So in this part of the course, these type of examples are what I could ask you to do. Write the reaction for, and then I gave you the names of all the components, as well as their states, right? So in the first example, it says lithium metal, with the exception of mercury, all metals are solids, plus fluorine gas combines to create solid lithium fluoride. So we can start to be able to read this and create a balanced chemical equation. So if we have lithium solid plus fluorine gas, Fluorine is one of our diatomic friends, so he comes with a pair. The question becomes, what is the chemical formula for lithium fluoride? What is the charge on a lithium ion? Plus one. What is the charge on a fluorine ion? Minus one. So those two things combine together in a one-to-one -one ratio. What is the state of lithium fluoride? solid. So now we need to make sure this equation is balanced. So a balanced chemical equation tells us that every element or the number of elements on the left is the same as the elements on the right. We're going to start by balancing these. We're going to balance some more exciting equations here in a minute. So there are for a combination or a decomposition or a combustion, I recommend the write out all the elements, balance, 
months, redo. When we move to the, I don't want to call them the more complicated versions here in just a second, but maybe something that's more interesting, I'm going to teach you a secondary method that will make that easier than this. Write down what you got on the left, on the right. On the left, we have one lithium. On the right, we also have one. Great news. We have two fluorines on the left, one on the right. We need to make these balance. The way we do that is by putting a two or a coefficient here. But now the lithiums don't balance. So now we have to go back to this side, put a two here, and now they balance. So our balanced chemical equation is two lithium solid plus F2 gas gives you two lithium fluoride solid. I heard a wait, wait. Yeah. Wouldn't the um, F2 be 2 fluoride? So now let's. Here? Balance? Yeah. Oh, but, wait, the cost, never mind. It's okay. Yeah. Do you want us to put, because like some like people, in particular, like you put like a 1 or not in front of like F2, do you want us to put a 1 or is it okay if we don't put a 1? So the question is do you have to put a coefficient when it is 1? You can if you'd like. I tend to not, as you don't need to. Um, that's up to you. My only request is that it's pretty clear that it's not a letter. I find that if you put a, a one, it looks kind of like an iodine. That's just, maybe that's my handwriting. So you don't have to, you can if you wish. Um, so I know you earlier included um, chlorine as one of your values. Mm -hmm. I was just curious as to why it is coming as a pair in this case is an ion. This here right. is not an ion. So it is fluorine gas is the diatomic. Basically, we have a solid and we pump gas like air over it. And then at the surface between those, it makes this lithium fluoride compound. So mm -hmm. this is where you encounter the fluorine ion. But this is where it functions as just fluorine gas. So it doesn't like break the bond and separate the two elements? It does, and we're going to talk a lot more how that happens, but like in chapter six. The short answer is yes. The double fluorine comes together, it breaks apart to make, to remake two new bonds. But when we encounter fluorine gas as a reactant, it is not yet ion. When it goes from here to here, and how exactly that happens is way outside the scope of Jenkins 1. But when it does that, what we're going to see is a transfer of basically they mix together to create a new compound. And this is where you see both of the ions. In this case, both of these come as their elemental components for the purposes of a combination reaction. Good question. Other questions? So the question is, why wouldn't the product be LiF2? So when we think about lithium fluoride, if you didn't have this equation, based on what we know about naming, would you have expected it to be LiF2 or just LiF? So things that are a diatomic come as a diatomic gas prior to their separation into their ion. They basically come as a pair, and then you break them apart to make the F minus, the two F minuses. So lithium has a singular positive charge. Fluorine ions, whether they start in F2 or they come out of a different compound, have a singular minus charge. In order to make that balance, it's lithi one lithium ion and one fluorine ion. So then it would have to be LiF. So it can't be LiF2 because that chemical is unstable. But in this case, it's a one-to-one -one component because of their electronics based on the periodic table. However, this is 
where the naming and memorizing the charges is going to be really important. So that you can be able to complete these types of things and then you can go back and look at them in other places. Does that kind of give you an answer? Other questions? For the second one, the decomposition of solid barium carbonate No, nope. solid barium carbonate decomposes into solid barium oxide and carbon dioxide gas. So barium carbonate, solid. So barium has a two plus, carbonate has a two minus. So one barium and one carbonate ion decomposes with heat into barium oxide, solid, plus CO2 gas. We should always confirm that our equations are balanced. We have barium, carbon, oxygen, one, one, three, Ba, C, O, one, one, three. Therefore, this equation is balanced as written. What questions do we have about this example? So let's look at the combustion of liquid methanol. So this example has a lot less words than the others, right? In the 2.3 video you were to watch, I don't want to say ages ago, there were eight carbon, were hydrocarbon, methanol, ethanol, butanol, propanol, methane, ethane, butane, propane. Yeah. Those are out of order. For combustion, because they're all the same, I can ask you to generate the products. Any combustion reaction gives you CO2 and water, always. And it always is your component plus oxygen. So methanol is CH3OH. It's liquid. We're going to add O2, which is a gas. We're going to get H2O gas plus CO2 gas. So now we're going to write CH2. So we have one carbon, four hydrogens, and three oxygens. One, two, three. So from here, we need to balance these. There is no right way to start this. Pick anywhere you want to go. It would be my recommendation that you not start with something that is a singular element, ever. Because you can come back and balance these pretty easily. So I'm going to start with hydrogen. Mostly because there's more of hydrogen here than there is over there. So I'm going to start by dropping a two in front of this hydrogen in front of the water. So now we have four hydrogens and four oxygens, and still just one carbon. So now we have to figure out how to get more oxygen on the left. Some of you might be like, oh, I can solve that problem. I'm going to put a three halves right here in front of the, CO, the O2. It turns out for balanced chemical equations, all coefficients must be whole numbers. I know. Uncool. So I'm going to go ahead and put one in front of the methanol. So I'm going to put a two here. And I've done that because this oxygen is alone. This plus these two needs to equal an even number that we see on the other side. So from here, I have two, eight, four. So you might be like, okay, it feels like we're just going back and forth. That's kind of how we balance an equation. If you go back and forth more than, so we started over here, so we did one, two, three, four. If you go past that, something has gone wrong. You shouldn't have to keep balancing on both sides. It should basically take a couple of trips, and that's it. If you've done all of that, Give yourself a, like a 10 second break 
and start back over at the problem. You likely forgot to count something. So now we have two carbons on the left. We need two carbons on the right. So that gives us a two here. Check. For the oxygens, we're going to come back to that. We're going to look at the hydrogens. We need to change this two for a four. So that gives us eight hydrogens. And for the oxygens, we now have four plus four is eight. So now we're going to come back over here. And we have four oxygens. So we're going to put a three in front of the CO2 so that we have two plus six to give us eight. And then we will rewrite the equation of two CH3 OH liquid plus three O2 gas gives us four H2O gas plus two CO2 gas. Questions? Yes? This? Yeah. So a combustion reaction is always the same. It's always your component plus O2, which it turns out in order for something to burn, you have to have oxygen. So it's that thing plus O2 gives you, and the purposes of Gen Chem 1, there's only one recoil. It's only one thing. And you can only get H2O and CO2. Okay. And then how do we know when we, so initially we had two H2O gases, and then this H2O So in that case, you, a combustion reaction always has the same parts. It's this plus O2, and that gives you H2O and water. The propane one? Yes. So I just didn't balance that equation. I gave you a balanced example equation. You could go back in and rebalance that equation for practice. So in that case, you would basically follow the same steps in order to get there. Yeah? I think I'm just discounting, but I keep discounting how there's eight hydrogens in the first part. So there's two here, right? And three times O2 gives you six. So together that gives you eight. It gets tricky. And it gets tricky over there when you start having oxygens, I don't want to say sprinkled everywhere, but they're everywhere. So that leads me to my next point. Yeah. Skip. Not all those, but those eight. Yes. Those eight you are responsible for. Yes. Mini exam two is where the naming will come to us and maybe not be our friends. Our goal is for it not to be like Taylor Swift, Death by a Thousand Cuts. Like, that's how we don't want to roll. Other questions? So we're going to start with the third example. Then we'll go back to the second. Because we started discussing, so what happens when stuff starts to get everywhere? sodium cyanide, NaCN, aqueous, plus copper to carbonate, aqueous, gives us sodium carbonate, aqueous, plus copper cyanide, We're going to do this two ways. The first way is very similar to what we just did. We're going to write it. We have sodium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, copper. We have one, two, one, one, three. 
Same deal over here. Make sure they line up when you use this method, because if they don't, it will be very painful. So when we do this, we can see that there's a difference between the carbon and the nitrogen on both sides. So where we got that? Well, there's two, there's only one sodium. We can see that there's a difference here, but the oxygen and the copper are the same. When we start to have elements that are compiled in all of the reagents, it becomes super tedious to try to like count them all up, right? And what I noticed is if you miss one of these somewhere, you're gonna go back and forth and never, they're never gonna balance because you've missed some part of this somewhere along the way. So we can go back and maybe say like, okay, well let's put a two in front of the sodium. So that gives us two sodiums, two, three carbons, two nitrogens, we still have three, one. Okay, so that balance. This wasn't that terrible. I would like to present to you an alternative method. I'm going to erase all of this. If anyone would like to write it down, I don't want to say speak now or hold your peace, but hopefully you got it. We're going to work this same example in a different way. When we think about sodium cyanide, we know it breaks down into two parts, a sodium ion and the cyanide ion. The majority of all components we're going to see in Jenkins 1 break down into an anion and a cation. That's just how this is going to roll. So we know that this is a sodium ion and a cyanide ion. So we can group these together When we start to balance things, so that when we look at this, we see one of each of these, we have one of each. Over here, we can see that we have two sodiums, two cyanide, one copper, one carbonate. Now, it's a little bit easier to say like, oh, we just need one more sodium and one more cyanide ion, and it turns out that those are together, right? So now, we just put a two here. In my opinion, this is a faster way to get to the same answer. Because we can group all of the carbons with their friends. So the carbonate ion doesn't collapse into something else. In not Gen Chem 1, it does all kinds of cool things. In Gen Chem 1, it says, I'm a carbonate ion, and then it moves over here, and it's still a carbonate ion. That's pretty much what it's going to do all semester long. So in this case, you can always break these down into their participants, and then be able to go like this. Questions. So when we look at these examples, the first two, the first one has some elements that are alone. This method will not work because it turns out you just have elements running around. It don't really break them apart. Whereas these, where we start to see other examples, you're going to want to break it down like this. So let's do the last. Writing at the top of the board. So we have chromium 
great. We have the nitride ion. We have the ammonium ion. We have the sulfate ion. So we have one, two, two, one. Over here, chromium, NO2, NH4, SO4. And it turns out we have one of each of these. So it doesn't make it substantially easier for you to balance this equation when you can tell that we have two nitrates and two ammonia, which are together in a single compound. So if we drop a two right here, we have finished balancing that equation. Question. Are you like grouping them? Like, like how is it not that you like group them like, down below in the equation? You just like split them off? Well, so in all of these, when you name this like in your brain, you see a chromium and a nitrite. So they basically break into those two parts. You have an anion and a cation, and they dissolve pretty much along that line. When they don't, when this method falls apart. So in the, either the first or the second example, both of those really, it turns out if you look at those, this method's not going to work because you don't have any polyatomic ions. This works when we start to see these polyatomic ion complexes where they can basically mix and match as you go across. I think these are more interesting than the other example of like, here are three elements, I think those are boring. I would pretty much never ask you to balance a combination or a decomposition reaction. It will always be something like this. Other questions? So, chapter three, part two. Formula weights, Avogadro's number, and the mole. If you are reading along in your textbook or the free OpenStax version, I've taken, I've basically made a delicious salad over several different sections. I took a little from here, a little from there, a little bit here, put it all together, reorganized it in a way that I think makes more sense. So if you are reading along in chapter three, we did section point one, section point two, now we're going to take 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, basically mush them all together and make some cool stuff. And then we'll get back on track. So, we are about to take a, not a good turn, but we're going to move away from thinking about things in terms of atomic mass units and begin to think about weighing out samples on a scale. If you are going to do a reaction, Nobody has set up a reaction when, like, I need 12 carbon atoms. No, you set it up and you're like, I need 5 grams of this. But we want to know how many carbon atoms are in 5 grams. So we're going to start to think about that. So as we think about this, the numbers on the periodic table that we definitely do not need to memorize, these tell us the atomic mass units per, what we're about to figure out, per mole. So in a grouping of these, we know that the formula weight is basically how much of this do we have? So the formula weight is the sum of the atomic weights for all of the atoms in the chemical formula. For sulfuric acid, which is H2SO4, we have two hydrogens, one sulfur, and four oxygens. To calculate the formula weight, we're going to sum up the atomic weight. Those are the numbers in our periodic table. So we're going to take 2 times 1.01 .01 atomic mass units plus 1 times 32.07 <clears throat> AMU, 4 times 16.00 AMU. We're going to add that up on our calculator, hopefully 98.09 atomic mass units. Next. You might be looking at that periodic table and being like, so oxygen has like 15.9999 more nines. In my class, we are going to round 
to two decimal places. On the periodic table. That's all you need. We're just going to round to two. Alex should be consistent with that. Should being the operative word, just so we're clear. <clears throat> when I solve Alex problems, I use two and get the right answer. If you use more than that, your answer is going to start to deviate from mine. When I write the keys, it's going to only use two. That's all you need to use. So the formula weight is basically the sum of the atomic weights. So for elements, the formula weight is the atomic weight, period. Basically, the atomic weight of sodium is the formula weight. Pretty simple. For a molecule, it's just the sum of all of the parts. So regardless of what element we have, this is what we see. We're going to skip this slide. We're going to come back to it. So the question becomes, atomic mass units. In, let's see, the 1840s, Amadeo Avogadro calculated that in 12 grams of carbon-12, there are exactly 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. This is Avogadro's number. You do not need to memorize this. It's going to be on, it, I think was on mini exam one, on the like standard, somewhere in there, I think. I will give it to you. You need to use this many digits. 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And so this is how many of anything is in a mole. So if you have a mole of, so one mole, so carbon 12 is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd carbon 12 atoms. One mole of sodium chloride is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd sodium chloride. One mole of Oreos is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd Oreos. So that means if you only have 9,000 Oreos, you could figure out how many moles of Oreos you have. And we're going to work on those in a minute. The thing is, all of these elements are scaled to the weight of carbon-12. So, moments ago, I told you that these are all in AMUs. In your brain, you can just take it over and like erase AMU and drop in grams per mole. So one mole of any element on this periodic table is equal to the mass that we see. So, so one mole of sodium chloride, let's start with sodium. One mole of sodium is equal to Twenty-two point nine nine grams per mole. One mole of chlorine is equal to thirty-five point four five grams per mole. There, maybe not therefore, but one mole of sodium chloride is equal to one sodium plus one chlorine. Twenty-two point nine nine. Thirty-five point four five. And that equals 58.44 grams per mole. So in all of these, we can start to calculate the atomic mass or the formula weight. I will use these terms interchangeably. Other people will not. I will always be asking you to total up any of the components in order to find the molar mass. You should calculate these. Yeah. Do these and bring them back on Wednesday, and we'll look at the answer. 
So, sorry. For indium sulfate, we want to start to be able to think about what is the atomic mass of that. So we have indium sulfate, <coughs> indium 2, SO4, 3. So the, the weight of this is 2 indium. There are 3 sulfurs. And then there are 12 oxygens. So the, each indium is 114.82 grams per mole. 3 times 32.07 grams. And 12 times 16.00. This gives you 517.85 grams per mole. So what we want to start to be able to think about is if we have a smaller portion of them, how many either moles or atoms do we have? So where we're going to go from this is the ability to calculate I have 15 grams of indium sulfate, how many moles do I have? So, remember that dimensional analysis stuff I taught you? This is how we're going to use it. It's a little different than what we did before, but like a lot the same. We're going to take our 15.0 grams of indium sulfate, and I want to know how many moles do we have. So we're going to use the molecular weight, or the formula weight, or the atomic weight. And we know that it's 517.85 gram in one mole of indium sulfate, which is 0.0. 28965 mole. So we're going to use our sig figs. This is what we started with. So we only have three sig figs, which is 0 0.0290 moles. So the dimensional analysis that we talked about is so that we know how to set these up. We know that there are 517.85 grams in one mole. If you have 15 grams, you can divide by the molecular weight and get the moles. We can also determine how many indium sulfate molecules are in this 0 0.0290 moles. I want to know how many molecules they are. In one mole, there's 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd indium, indium sulfates which gives you 1.744 times 10 to the 22nd indium sulfates. So on Wednesday, where we are going to pick up, I would like you to attempt to calculate the formula weights for these two components. So that's slide 12. I would also like you to think about so here, there are five examples. We're going to start by working these examples on slides 12, 15, and 16. It would be best if you could spend time thinking about those prior to Wednesday. That way you started to process through, how would I set this up? If you try and you don't know, that's okay. Just show up. We'll figure it out. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I will see you on Wednesday.